Hello there, friends, and welcome to a very special episode of the Paranatural Podcast. My name is Ben. Hello? Hello? Jacob? Well, it seems my co-host has perished. Probably got chased into Mel's hole by a pack of dogmans. Oh well, on with the show. I'm just kidding, Jake's fine. Recently, he and I had the pleasure of sitting down with our new friends, Matt and Dave, from the Blue Ribbon Lounge podcast. We had a great time talking to those fine fellows, mostly about the strange happenings in Massachusetts' Bridgewater Triangle, but also a few other fun and interesting things. I really enjoyed the conversation, and I think you will too. And check out the Blue Ribbon Lounge podcast. Matt and Dave have a really great show. They talk about a lot of topics similar to the topics we cover here, and they do it in a laid-back, conversational manner that feels like a chat with close friends. And speaking of a chat with friends, here's our chat with Matt and Dave. Yeah, so I I really enjoyed uh, the history of the area. Um, but I guess probably get start right off with the description of the area where, where it's out of Bridgewater triangle. Yeah, that's pretty much where I, my stuff started too. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, Massachusetts though, what is it? 200 square miles, uh, in the center of Massachusetts, uh, between the three towns of Abington, Freetown and Rehoboth, Rehoboth. Rehoboth. Which yeah. is not how that is spelled. No. <laughs> Come on, Massachusetts. Get your shit together. Right. <laughs> I like Freetown. You know, it is straight to the point. Uh, so in the 1970s uh, is where I saw it started, all started taking off. Oh, well, uh, the cryptozoologist, Laura and Coleman. Yep. That was the guy. He named it. Yeah. Oh, he named it. Yeah, he uh he came up with the name. He started doing investigations down there. Okay. And the guy is a prolific investigator. If you haven't looked into much of his stuff, I you should. Yeah. He is absolutely is, prolific. Is he a guy that you've followed before like maybe even outside of Bridgewater? I've yeah, oh, absolutely. I I what? was I was that close to visiting his cryptozo- cryptozoology museum in Portland, Maine. Oh really? It was, it was closed when I passed through. Oh, oh shit. damn! And that was years ago. Huh. But uh, yeah, he's a he's a very prolific cryptozoologist, and just he like started, the stuff he's found, or what do you mean by prolific on that? Just uh, the reports that he's taken, and the places he's gone and investigated, and the books that he's written. Uh, he's done all kinds of stuff. Oh, okay, really helped out the community on oh big on time kind of stuff. He's like one of the OG. You know, at least as far as, you know, right. nowadays go one that's still around. OK. And, and uh, he started researching all of these sightings and recording and documenting all these witness accounts from that area and point pinpointing them on a map mm. and uh, realized yeah. that it all existed in that kind of triangle General shaped triangle. area. Yeah. Yep. The triangle, the devil's shape, obviously. <laughs> everything, everything bad ends up being a triangle. It does. It does. Bermuda, Bridgewater. Yeah. Right. I, I had heard uh, a, a different one, the Bennington Triangle in yep, Vermont. that's another one. Yep, oh, there's yeah. There's another one. There's another one, uh, Lake Michigan. Yep, the Lake Michigan oh, Triangle. Wisconsin. Um, mm-hmm. Holland. That's cool. Yeah. Just, yeah, it's like Holland, right. Ludington, and Milwaukee, I think. Yeah, I believe yeah, I think so. All, all the, I mean, you take a look at a pentagram, and it's got quite a few triangles in there, right? Or maybe not. Yeah, maybe get, into a a quadri- get into it, quadri- Get into it. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Unleash the beast on it. <laughs> it's just geometry is spooky in itself. Yeah, yeah no just, kidding. And hard, if all you're... Right. you know. <laughs> yeah. So it's proofs, I'm telling you. <laughs> No, the Edmund Fitzgerald went missing and or sunk in the Michigan Triangle, right? 
No, I think that was Lake Superior, bud. Was it? Yeah. Oh. Uh, I've only heard the <laughs> song. Right. I've only heard I wouldn't song. have known any better. <laughs> hey, Ben. Shush. <laughs> they wouldn't believe me. <laughs> well, edit, edit that one out. <laughs> Uh, so it sounded like the majority of what was taking place in the Bridgewater Triangle. Uh, I heard a lot about the the Hockamock Swamp, and then the Falls River Forest was like eighty percent of where. Yeah, it seems like that's the two most uh, active areas. Right. It seems like they have every kind of anything that you want there. Oh, like, yeah, you could play paranormal bingo with that place. Oh, that would be cool. Like you got, <laughs> you got. I got like a small list here: UFOs, Sasquatches, ghosts, uh, giant snakes, which should not exist in Massachusetts. <laughs> right? Yeah, they got just puckwudgies. Uh, they got everything going on up there. Balls of fire. Yep, fire. Uh, ghost fire too. Yeah, ghost a lot of fire. people. A lot of people report seeing uh, these fires like off in the distance. And then when they like go to try to sneak up on it, it's just gone. Which Ugh. I learned from your guys' podcast, uh, Christopher Columbus. He was seeing stuff like that too. Oh yeah, yeah. down was... by the Bermuda Triangle. Yeah, well, past it, I think it was technically it was, but yeah, yeah. That, that stuff's crazy. Right. It, it happens all over, man. Ghost fires. As far as history goes, did you guys see what Hakamak means? Hakamak. Uh, Yes. A place where spirits dwell. Also can be translated to evil spirits. Oh. Uh, and in other Algonquian languages, there are words that are closely derived from Hakamak, like Hakamako, which mean evil place, evil spirit. It's like we would use devil. Oh, really? Yeah. Because so. I did I did see that uh, the white settlers started calling it Devil's Swamp, right? Yep, yep, yeah. which Hakamak is, can roughly translate to something like devil, demon, mm. evil, spirit. Yeah, that's cool. But so. I thought that was also a, one of their burial grounds or something. Like it was sacred to them is what I heard. Um, Cause it, cause one lady I heard said there was an island somewhere in the swamp that they were actually finding like all these native american graves yeah allegedly they found um well it i guess it kind of depends so they used the hakamak swamp during the war with the settlers to hide yeah and so you know there's gonna be things there but there's like i think was that hakamak or freetown i can't remember which one i should have wrote it down <laughs> one of them has a grave site that is like eight thousand years old yeah, I had seen that. So and I thought it was within the swamp. Crazy. Finding... It might have been. Is that the but, one where they found that boulder? Because I know yeah, that, that was... was in that lake that is in the swamp. Okay. The one with all the carvings on it. Yeah, and like pictures of faces and stuff. Yeah, which is kind of crazy. Yeah, and... I had heard I had heard that a lot of different weird rocks were kind of kind of come up in Massachusetts as general. Mm-hmm. I thought that was pretty interesting. That, I didn't look too far into it, but I didn't either. That was just what they said in the documentary. Yeah. Did you guys watch that? I watched about half of it. Okay. I watched the whole ding dang thing. Yeah. Did you see the rock in question? Was it the the one that was scribbled on or? Yeah. The one uh, that had all the chiseled stuff on it. Yeah. It looked like a piece of driftwood kind of, right? Yeah, it did. It did kind of have that look to it, but apparently it's made of stone. But. Like, they can't decide who carved the damn thing. Yeah. Which is like, really weird. Because they were even saying, like, Norse or maybe even, like, Chinese something. Like, explorers from the... the it was, Well, what uh, language is it in? That's just it. They can't really figure that out. Because there are some symbols on it that look Portuguese, yeah. which would have been from, like, the 1500s. There are some symbols on it, which I recognized being you know norse pagan myself okay. as being potentially runic but it's All so right. worn out you can't and obviously i was watching it on a documentary yeah and then there's others that they can't really attribute to anything including wow. the tribes that lived in the area yeah i think so, that's why they got chinese or something because like the glyphs kind of maybe my theory on the rock is that somebody carved something on it 
And then just like a, you know, picnic table at the park, somebody else walked up and said, oh, hey, they carved on it. So I'm going to carve on it. And then somebody else comes up and says, oh, look at all these carvings. I'm going to carve my name on it. So I think yeah. it's a it's an amalgamation that they're chasing their own tail, trying to figure out who did it. That makes sense. Yeah. Do you think it was recent or do you think it was was from a long time ago? I think it started out in ancient times. Mm, OK. You know, maybe the natives carving glyphs on it because they did do stuff like that. You know, yeah. petroglyphs are a thing. Yeah. And then, you know, maybe the Norse were we can't prove they were in that area, but it kind of makes sense. Maybe they chiseled like, you know, Sven was here on the thing. Yeah. Then, <laughs> you know? Lee, Fer- Lee Ferrick's and rules. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. Lee Ferrick and sucks dick, you know, whatever. <laughs> right. And uh, then, you know, you get other people come along and go, hey, look, everybody else is carving on this thing. I'll carve on it, too. I could see that. That makes sense. Which is, that's interesting. It's not paranormal, but it's interesting. No, yeah. yeah. Well, they also talked about that rock that uh, somebody wrote a poem on. Yeah. And they don't know who. Yeah. They have uh, no idea what it means. Well, I thought they were trying to say it was, uh, I had it written down. Timothy Otis Payne, I think. I have and no idea was, who that is. He was a... Uh, like a Freemason, they did a lot of uh, like granite work around there, like building bridges, like stone bridges and stuff around the area. That would make sense. The carving on it is very pretty. Yeah, but I don't. They say he's somehow connected to uh, Increase Mather, who was like uh, the son of the guy who did all the burning in Salem, the witch mm. burnings. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if that's some kind of connection, but I saw like a like a public access show where they were talking about it. And there was a lady trying to like make it more spooky than it actually was. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's just a poem carved on a rock. Really? Yeah. Yeah. A good poem for sure though. Uh, apparently yeah. somebody the way, okay. What, what, how did you take the poem gentlemen? Was it like a love lost poem or, or cause that's how I took it. I took it as a pining for some lost love type deal. Uh, I don't remember it too well off the top of my head, but from what, from what I remember, I mean, it was kind of like, you know, I think you're right about the pining, mm-hmm. but maybe not necessarily for someone. Okay. Uh, and I don't necessarily think you said that, uh, but, uh, definitely a loss of like some sort of feeling within you. Okay. All right. I, I can dig that interpretation. Yeah. Some sort of like all who are all who are wander all who wander are not lost type of thing is what I kind of took away right. from it. Hey, that's the beauty part of poetry. It means something <laughs> different to everyone yeah. who encounters it. And yeah. since we don't know who carved it, we can't ask them. So they're yeah, dead right. anyway. Yeah, and the whole reason they found that is because of a lost canoeer. Yeah, the girl that went missing. Yeah, and just mad or coincidentally they found her body by this stone <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah that's a little weird yeah. uh, but i mean when you're finding bodies left and right i found to come across a cool <laughs> stone every once in a while search in the woods for somebody yeah it seems like they had bodies well that was more of the swamp but then like the freetown forest oh that place that place <clears throat> so much bad stuff happened there yeah um, because it seemed like it was very there's a lot of satanic cults in that area. Um, that was what I I most of what I came across with the Freetown Forest was satanic cult. Yeah, yeah. Because there was an animal cemetery that they actually shut down because people were going in there and digging up the bones for different yep, rituals. Y- yep, using the skulls. Yeah, the- and then um there were those three teenagers that broke into a mausoleum and like stole the body and chopped the head off. Yeah. So, geez, Louise. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. That's, that's Guys, some real driven on. stuff. But I mean, they like had it in their car, but it was too stinky. So they oh. ended up like <laughs> ditching it. I mean, I what, what did they think was going to happen? <laughs> yeah. yeah like, I can't imagine that car is ever going to be the same. <laughs> well, they wanted to drink out of it, you know, get some power, drink out of a skull. <laughs> no thank you well i think you have to like if you're gonna do it you have to read the dates 
on the plaque because if it's too recent it still has hair and like skin on it well yeah i mean and no matter what date it was put in the mausoleum at least run it through the dishwasher one time guys God damn. <laughs> right. well and I mean, if it was in a mausoleum would it necessarily lose like its skin or would it just dry out well, that's a good point i don't know uh um, it's not like bugs be eating on it right i'm sure somebody knows that the answer to that question but my search history is too fucked up already for me to look that one up <laughs> leave it in the comments if you know the answer <laughs> yeah, there you go. let us know posing bodies uh both the uh the uh blue ribbon lounge and paranatural podcast have facebook groups get in there uh and let us know if you guys know how bodies decompose because yeah. except for the deer on the side of the road i got no idea <laughs> yeah. they get extra big before they start <laughs> Yeah, but I guess that was became a tourist destination, so they actually had to like brick up the mausoleum to keep people from like trying to react or yeah. reenact what happened. Yeah, I saw that too. That's that's rough when you got to do yeah. stuff like that. But the uh, oh man, what was that guy's name? He wrote the book too, Christopher something or other. Uh, Pittman. On, in that documentary, he said that like, and I kind of I'm kind of with this. He thinks that there's like an evil force in Freetown Forest I, that brings all this stuff there. Like it's a symptom yeah, of it. I, I think I think that for sure. Uh, a lot of the things I got wrapped up in were like uh, the insane asylum and the uh, the maximum security prison and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Uh, and I couldn't find a ton about them. But like just the things that I found out for that all to be condensed into one space definitely felt like it was being a black hole for for a lot of evil. No, I didn't find a whole lot about any of that. So if you want to get into that, then uh, you I, have I want to do the his- I want to do the history. First. Oh, all right. Go the back ki- to the it, King then. Philip War. Oh, yeah, cool? yeah, yeah. Go ahead. That, that was some of my favorite stuff. Uh, so uh, the King Philip War in the 1700s were uh, was. Um, what a generation after uh the first thanksgiving and so the, uh king philip was metacomet of pekinokin and all all these words are going to be terrible for me <laughs> uh but metacomet uh was the uh sacum or chief of the pekinoek tribe <laughs> of Pekinoekin. natives uh and so he he was growing up in an age where uh, settlers had already uh, been in the area for a while. They've already started gentrifying the natives. He actually got an education at Harvard from what I saw. Uh, and so he and he also probably spoke a lot of English as well as Native American. Um, and they say that this war was one of the most na- one of the most brutal wars in the uh, American history with the natives. Uh yeah, they said like 5% of the population of New England got killed in that war. Yeah. And it was it was a lot of uh what the um Massachusetts militia versus the uh Micmac and Wapanoak tribes um and so one of the last battles that uh the natives won was in uh Sudbury Massachusetts and I believe they have a monument there um so that would be kind of cool to see if you're ever in the area Mm -hmm. uh that was one of the last ones that the natives won and then after that they really started getting sick um with all the all the diseases and stuff that the the white man brought to the Americas uh and so a lot of natives were giving up and also uh their forces were being overrun uh at the same time uh and so as the natives started going downhill uh with in the battle uh they finally fa- caught and killed um king phillips or metacomet metacomet um they drawn and quartered his body they decapitated him was that where they rip you apart by horses yes that is where you're attached to generally four horses and then the four horses are sent in four different directions brutal 
Yeah. And well, and it sounded like they had shot him before they uh, quartered him. But I would imagine at that point, you're just trying to get some of your frustration out and sh- and show all the other natives what's going to happen when we catch you going you're making against a us. making a symbol out of him yeah uh well, and speaking of symbols out of him they uh so who was it uh john alderman and captain benjamin church were uh two of the people who led the forces when they finally did kill uh metacomet uh john alderman was a praying indian which is to say that he uh, changed over to the Christian faith. Uh, and so he was on the side of the English. Uh, we call those when- traitors. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, and so when they killed uh, Metacomet, he actually got one of his hands, which he would parade around to the different taverns and the taverns would let him drink for free while everybody else got to admire the hand, Mm -hmm. which is a dang good uh, (laughs) job resource. I think, I mean, uh, and then they decapitated Metacomet and put him on the uh, gates of the nearest fortress, which I, I didn't actually look to see what fortress that was. Uh, was I've got it. Fort Plymouth. Yeah. Fort Plymouth. Uh, So yeah, definitely made a symbol out of him. And I heard it it was, 20 years but i also yeah. saw something that said like 200 years so. no it was well, 20 20 was what i saw anyway okay yeah. his head I, on a pike for 20 years right like Speaking guys smelly skulls yeah, yeah right and guys i get a grudge but come on 20 years that's a little long there we go guys dead well i mean it's at, at some point at some point you just walk by and it's there right you kind of yeah you kind it, of ignore imagine. it i guess <laughs> but uh so once they found Metacomet, um, his second in command, Antoan, uh, still sent the natives to keep fighting, uh, and and they continued to lose. The uh, English militia did uh, find out where they were keeping him. They kept hiring uh, more of these praying Indians to help them because they were they knew the area. They were good. Uh, hunters so they finally came upon uh antoine's and the rest of the uh wapanoic campsite and the english sneak in uh antoine i believe gave up okay he was gonna he, i think he offered them uh metacomet's wampum belt so the the wampum belt from what i was told was uh it like tells the history of uh, a tribe. And even though Antoine kind of gave it over as a show of good faith, uh, they killed him and took the belt. And that is what a lot of people may think uh, started this whole blackened curse area. So maybe a, maybe a native church or a native curse or uh, what are they? That's like a trope, right? Where they're, you build something on a native Indian burial ground. Yeah, it's a very big trope. Yeah. Everything in the East Coast that's on it is built on a native burial ground. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Also, but I, I'm, I'm really into that kind of history. And that was just, mm-hmm. I, I thought, an amazing story. It really is. It really is. But then that's um, whether that war is what started to put like the blight on the land or if it was already there before. Because like you were saying... It was already called Devil's Swamp, or yeah, which that is the question, you know. And do do evil actions bring a place to evil, or is the place evil and that brings evil action? That's a it's something you can debate for a very very long time yeah, if you wanted sure. to. And not a not an answer is going to happen either. It's one of those no, not that, a that is one. unanswerable. If uh, if there were answers to these questions, we wouldn't have so much fun doing these podcasts, <laughs> yes. gentlemen. Somebody, somebody with a bigger brain would have told us by now, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Instead of just a bunch of weirdos talking about it on the internet. Right. I did see that it was like, they have large granite deposits there, so there mm-hmm. might be a, an overabundance of quartz, and that can somehow like, some kind of pseudo-electric charge that the quartz give off. So you're a stone tape theory guy. Kinda, yeah. All right, but all right. I also tried to find a map of ley lines, 
mm-hmm. and it looks like there's a point right off the coast of Massachusetts, but not like on this like triangle area. Interesting. Well, I mean, I I was looking at some of the stuff, and and it's pretty obvious that like they just took those two, uh, or those three cities to make the triangle, you know. But it's it's kind of like uh, you know when you turn on a water faucet, the water hits everywhere and just kind of vortexes in. So like the I didn't I didn't hear too much about the dog track, but I heard it brought up a few times, and that's technically outside of the triangle, right? So. It's Every, like a splash zone. There's stuff that exists outside of it. A splash zone is probably a good way to put it, actually. Yeah. This is where the droplets hit. Yeah. The dog track has a lot of the UFO stuff that's happened over mm. it, apparently. That's okay. a, most of what I was hearing from that. Is that the one with the uh, like home plate shaped? <laughs> that was the one. It was near the dog track, if I remember correctly. Okay. Did you watch the documentary you said? Yes, I did. Where the guy actually brought a home plate and was like, it looks <laughs> yeah, just like this. Hell, yeah, I, I don't even, it, yeah, it was just like a piece of plastic that he I, cut into the shape of a home plate and he stuck a flashlight on the bottom of it when it looked like that. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, I guess as far as visual representations go, it works, but yeah. Well, and in that, didn't they say they took a bunch of eyewitness reports and then like had a sketch artist draw it? They did indeed. Where, oh, I didn't I was get interested a number. to see what that looked like. I did not get a number for how many people supposedly saw that thing. It was they they made it sound like it was like more than nine. I want to well, say like, it was in double digits, right? Uh what I have refer- is lots they of referenced people. A, yeah, they referenced <laughs> lots, lots of people. people. Lots of people. They referenced That's- a bunch of couple of ways, like they saw a bunch of uh reports in the newspaper and uh on the radio, and then they talked about how many people they had uh within the sketch artist. So I mean Mm. obviously numbers can be kind of inflated or deflated. right but what i do know is these two guys that the that were in the documentary they're reporters themselves oh and public figures that were on the radio station the local radio station so you know a little credibility point for them there mm-hmm. and there are a lot of people or they were talking about quite a few people didn't want their re- names within the reports which is really common yeah well, yeah. a common for people who probably saw something. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to people who just want a little bit of cred or or waste your time, I guess. Yeah, it, it's that debate can go both ways, too. Yeah, for sure. You know, I mean, you know, the hoaxers obviously are going to want their names out there, but there are also people that just don't care what other people think. Yeah, that's true. You know, they're like, you know what? I saw it. Believe me. Don't believe me. I don't give a damn. Yeah. You know. So what are some of your other guys' uh, favorite stuff? Like I heard a lady in a white dress and then some sort of redheaded hitchhiker. I thought those were pretty <laughs> tropic, but interesting. The redheaded hitchhiker one made me laugh. Yeah. So we'll just give a background on the legend for anybody listening who doesn't want to sit through this documentary. <laughs> Is uh, apparently along a certain stretch of road in the Bridgewater Triangle area, if you're driving you may come across a red-headed lumberjack-looking hitchhiker. Lumberjack. Now, there's different ways to encounter him. Some of it's driving. Some of it's like you shut your car off and flash the lights three times, and when you turn your car back on, he'll be standing in front of you. And another one is uh, if there's three passengers in your vehicle, he'll just appear in the seat next to you or next oh. to that, you know, in the back seat, whatever. All of your hitchhiker-type tropes have been attributed to this guy. Now, good. Like all the other stories, they're saying they're putting all into this one guy. All into this one guy. Oh, so okay. any of your hitchhiker ghost stories that you hear from around the country, and there are quite a few, all get attributed like this guy does all that stuff. Yeah. Now, what I found interesting was that in the documentary, the these the area researchers that they talked to, there's a spot in the documentary where they kind of like mishmash all these guys one after the other saying nobody has a firsthand account of this guy, this hitchhiker. Okay. It's always like my cousin's brother's uncle's <laughs> nephew and stuff like that. So it's very urban legendy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, one of those that may have, in my opinion, some sort of, of basis in truth. Somebody or some people may have seen something at some point. 
but now it's just an urban legend. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Not to not to break this runoff, but uh but we have an urban legend here. Mm-hmm. Uh it's called Crybaby Bridge, mm-hmm. where you, you drive up to it and then you stop the car and it, kids are supposed to push you across. Mm-hmm. Do you guys have anything out where you guys are at? Jake, that's your area of expertise, bud. You do the urban legends. Okay. So where I was from in Michigan, where I'm still from, from Michigan, <laughs> but since I moved, um, we had the dog man. I did an episode on it, the Michigan dog man. Um, there's a song about it. If you haven't heard it, you need to. Um, it's great. On YouTube, I'd imagine. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it starts in Wexford County. Um, bunch of lumberjackers or or lumberjacks are in the woods and they see this really big dog but it seemed to be in a pretty playful mood and it's gonna rhyme i know it is because i'm quoting the song right now (laughs) but uh they chase it and it runs inside a hollow log dog and uh well it apparently let out this like unearthly shriek came up and stood upright and stood seven foot four um and every every seventh year so like 1907 19 or 1917 1927 all that it'll come out right around october and i actually i'm pretty sure i saw it Um, oh i got I want to call it proof and there's a million people who would disagree with me, but I have picture proof, not of the actual thing, but of dog prints bigger than my hand, which I got big hands. Yeah. Um, And Michigan, some people like to say we have wolves. Show me a wolf that gets that big and also show me a wolf in the wild in Michigan, not in the UP, but uh, yeah. So, every like 10 years i guess but the seventh year of that decade um it'll come around and some people say there's multiple some people say it's just an everlasting beast that can't die um as far as people being harmed by it there's no stories on that but like there's animals that have died of fright there's been just mutilations of cows deer um apparently this thing can jump like four stories whoa um i mean if it's seven foot seven foot four (laughs) yes those (laughs) last four inches are pretty important it is um it's ripped doors off of an old church which i actually did see that church um it's nearby harrietta where i grew up a town that nobody has ever heard of like it's an actual ghost town like by title um but yeah it's probably two miles from my buddy's house and we went and checked it out sure as shit the door that maybe once was there there's these huge claw marks like on the frame next to it Oh, um, and it's a church, so like it's pretty much like falling apart right now, yeah. But so when I saw it, it was 2007, believe it or not. And I was with my friend Gage, which I've mentioned so many times in this podcast. Um, and he's a chicken shit for this, <laughs> <laughs> Gage, yeah. So we walk. We walked to check my live traps. I'm a trapper. And uh, about a mile away from my house, there's just this big, probably 100 acres of uh, pine trees and all that stuff. It's dark. It's probably 11 o'clock in October, so really dark. And we have a flashlight, a BB gun, and a knife. I'm holding the flashlight and the knife. My buddy has the BB gun. We walk out there and we keep hearing like coyotes and stuff, which is very normal. And 
when we got about a mile away, I hear this huge, it had to have been probably three inch branch snap. That was enough to get my attention. Yeah, that's a big branch. Those things yeah. don't just fall for nothing. Right. Not windy or anything. Honestly, there was like no sound other than coyotes and then that branch. Yeah. I mean, even if it was a storm, I mean, even if it was a dead branch, a storm's got to be rolling through to snap a three inch branch. Oh, yeah. So I, I shine the light over there and it, there's some snow. So like you can see, you can see the outline of the woods. Like you can see the first couple of trees. Yeah. With the, with the snow on the ground and then the flashlight, not a good flashlight. So where I shine the light after my buddy's freaking out and telling me to shine it over there, uh, I saw what looked like a bear. It was on four four legs and it was huge which bears aren't uncommon but then it's probably i want to say 10 15 feet in front of the tree line it stands up it was huge yeah i was i was kind of frozen in fear and like i don't know if you guys have ever been scared enough to wear like all your senses just dim and you're focused on one thing. Like you can't hear, you can't like nothing else is standing out except for what you're paying attention to. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, well, so I look back at my friend to see his, Oh shit face. And he's halfway back to my house (laughs) with the BB gun. (laughs) (laughs) So I take off running didn't hear anything. I was too afraid to look out of the windows all night because of, listen to the song. You'll understand. Yeah, he's because a peeping Tom, right? This mother effort grins. He <laughs> smiles at you. Um, yeah. Uh, so we go back out there in the morning to see like if we can find anything. And that's when I found those, those big ass paw prints. So I take pictures of them and I still got them at my mom's house. But yeah. This that was a good one. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I've ever run into anything like that. That I know, I know bear prints. I know, I know all the prints of animals in Michigan, and that it was it was dog tracks, definitely just gigantic, big ass dog tracks. Yeah, that's crazy. That was a cool story, man. Thank you. <laughs> And um, that's the one thing they don't have in Bridgewater is dog man. Actually, <laughs> take that. I just came across something that said they have enormous dogs. Well, yeah, big dogs are not dog man. They could be. <laughs> <laughs> it dip- well, so so they just gets kill frisky. everybody that sees the man part. Yeah, right, there you go. Someone gets frisky with a dog and it gets the size it gets bigger. But the the canine part is more dominant. So it looks more like a dog, but it's got it's got some dog or it's got some man in it. Got a little bit of man in it, <laughs> and that's how it was created it too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, around here, everyone likes to tell me this legend that I they want me to look up. I can't find enough on it to do an episode. It's called the Bunny Man. Oh. Yeah, and I wish my brother was in here right now because he could he could talk more about it. There's a movie, but it has nothing to do with the legend. So apparently years and years ago, there was a serial killer who would dress up in a bunny outfit, kill people, which that part is true. But um, a, a group of local people got together, hunted him down, killed him kind of like a freddy krueger thing he didn't want to stay dead so now like uh there's a certain bridge it's always about a bridge but there's a certain bridge where if you're alone at night and like you'll hear whistles and he'll end up coming and killing you oh yeah i'll look more into it but there's not enough for an episode yeah, you'll make it work. I mm. think that sounds good, though. So yeah. you guys went to your crying bridge. It, or, yeah, or I've been there. Again? 
Have this crybaby bridge. There you it's go. It's like in the middle of the country or in the yeah the countryside, <laughs> and it's like uh like a bus. The legend is because it's like a kind of a blind curve on like mm-hmm. a one lane gravel road, and then there's this uh metal bridge, and the story is the bus driver was going too fast and went off the bridge, mm-hmm. and for the longest time there was a school bus in the ravine, oh. but then uh people graffitied all over it and then burning candles in there they thought it was a fire hazard so the city finally pulled it out but if you go and stop your car in the middle of the bridge and put it in neutral and turn Mm. it off yeah you'll slowly get pushed across so did you get pushed yeah i've gotten pushed before (laughs) i remember watching that on uh unsolved mysteries and they say if you put uh like baby powder on the or flour or something yeah you see the little handprints because mm-hmm. we tried that and it looked like little fingers it wasn't like a whole handprint but you could see like little fingers on it oh no way yeah it was crazy i took my daughter out there like one october just to freak her out <laughs> <laughs> did it work yeah she did not want to hang out because i'm like no nope. i'm like let's go walk around the bridge now she's like nope i'm not getting out <laughs> smart girl yeah that yeah. was probably one of the first scary stories i ever heard uh me and my brother used to watch unsolved mysteries all the time and oh that's cool yeah and the fingerprint one you remember me telling you about pier cheney i know i'm mm-hmm. pronouncing it wrong yes you are shut up ben <laughs> but yeah uh fingerprints i've i've had those happen too yeah. my buddy justin him and i went out there and Saw some crazy stuff. I got some crazy stuff on my GoPro and we got the little kids, but legend has it. They're cold and trying to get in. Oh, okay. Ooh. Keep the windows up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No kidding. <laughs> get possessed by a 10 year old ghost. <laughs> Man, I don't know if my teeth could take all those gummy worms. <laughs> <laughs> Would be nice to sit around and watch cartoons and eat cereal for a day, though. Are you <laughs> right. kidding me? I do that anyways. Right. <laughs> All right. Not to not to sidetrack it too much, but that was good. I'm glad we get to hear that story. That was good. Not to sidetrack it too much. That just went all the sidetrack, my <laughs> yeah. friend. <laughs> all right. So we're getting back to our triangle now, fellas. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? All right, where do we want to go next? Uh, I'd like to bring up, just because this is one of your favorite subjects, they state a lot of shadow people there. Was that on the documentary? No, I don't think it was. No? No. Um, uh, did you guys hear anything about it? I did not uh, hear it. I heard about a, a shadow person at one of the... Uh, maybe it was the... Uh, taunton state hospital there's mm-hmm. a a shadow man that haunts the halls there um, the, the taunton state hospital for the mentally ill you gotta yeah. say the whole thing to, to really oh, give yeah. it that flavor yeah we we know all about the the <laughs> mental hospitals and stuff um not that one in particular <laughs> but um yeah so i i saw i actually saw a few things about that um people mentioned ghouls around the yard mm. and then the shadow person and then that swamp that you guys were talking about uh there's a shadow or a few shadow people um surrounding the wampum belt or however you pronounced it um legend has it that it's a curse of paranormal unrest until the native people have it back and that's mm. what's causing all this that's one legend or yeah yeah theory. when you said shadow people uh they also connect with the <clears throat> pudge walkers wedge puckers puck wedges pud wedges yeah uh some people say when they see the little fuckers that there's also like a shadow person mm-hmm. that's like kind of con- maybe controlling them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I saw one video 
they were supposed to be connected to that, but it was like of a girl being possessed in the mm-hmm. woods. Yeah. Yeah. That video was in the documentary too. Oh, I know I saw it somewhere. Yeah, it was, yeah. It's on YouTube. It's in the documentary. It's, I don't know exactly what to think about that one, honestly. Yeah. Well, they said they were also close to the ledge or the edge or whatever mm-hmm. it was called. And that's where the lady in white supposed to be. Mm-hmm. And that one's kind of like your the hitchhiker one where it's like uh, the lady's lover got detained or her dad said they couldn't be lovers. So she threw herself from the mm-hmm. cliff and that now you see her up there like and she'll throw herself off the cliff, which I'm pretty sure anywhere there's a cliff in the woods. <laughs> there's a story of some young woman or man who launched himself off of it because of you know unrequited love or something along yeah. those lines but there's yeah there's a lover's leap like in every state like everywhere the, everywhere the most the most uh noble of hauntings is the there lover's you. leap <laughs> noble of hauntings <laughs> other than the ghost lovers right yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's just when they go together so you know <laughs> so uh i also came across this thing called the dover demon that was yeah. way outside the Bridgewater Triangle. Really? Because it says it was... I think. I don't know. Maybe I don't know geography that I, well. I just wanted to see if you guys heard anything about that. I had I had heard about the Dover Demon, and I think I had heard of it before. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know much about it, though. That would be... Uh, to get into that one would be a whole episode on its own. Oh, really? Oh, absolutely. There's a lot to it. But mm-hmm. essentially, it was this little alien frog combination little dude that a bunch of people saw in Dover, Massachusetts mm-hmm. for a few days. And his name was Ben. <laughs> <laughs> we had the same haircut. You know, oh, no. Ben none. Dover. Ben Dover. Ben Dover. Oh, ben Dover. <laughs> If I had a fucking dollar for every time. Anyway. (laughs) I had to. That one I thought was just like three teenagers or something that saw it. Like there was two groups of them. Oh, I think if I remember the story right. Because that's the one where you drew a picture of it. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it looks like Mac and me bent over. It does. Hot dog fingers. <laughs> yeah, that's a good description. That is very accurate. <laughs> yeah. Hot dog fingers. I just remember that one because he wrote like, "I swear on a stack of Bibles, I saw this thing" or something like that. Whoa, Dave coming with the quotes. Look at that shit. Gonna... <laughs> you go ahead and take this one from here, bud. That's all I know about it. It's just that part, <laughs> like seeing that picture. Yeah, yeah. It's uh in uh, Lauren Coleman's museum. He has like a taxidermied like. You know, obviously it's fake or whatever, but yeah. it's modeled after that picture. He's got a model of it in his museum. That's awesome. Huh. So that's funny. You said the taxidermy jack or uh, jackalopes were fake. They're not. <laughs> okay, <laughs> whatever you say, but <laughs> so <clears throat> what about the giant birds? Ooh, oh, the Thunderbirds. Thunder yeah, Thunderbirds. Which would yeah. be a great. 80s cartoon. I mean, they had the Thundercats. <laughs> yeah, Thunder Thunderbirds Cats. would be on par, I think. I think yeah. there was a show with Thunderbirds, and it was like a that like marionette puppet kind of show. Wait, like a creepy one back <laughs> oh, in the 70s. No, I, think, I, I think that's actually ringing a bell. Yeah, I, Not- I think that's where they got the idea for that Team America movie. Yeah, oh. World Police. Yeah, love Trey Parker. <laughs> Yeah, so, so like, go, ahead. go ahead. No, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just, like, what is there on the Thunderbirds? All I know is it's either like a large bird or it's a pterodactyl. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, apparently, a uh, sheriff was one of the first to report it. Okay. Yeah, he was a sheriff's deputy or something. Yeah. But he reported sites after after hearing rumors of it. He was the one of the first to actually report it. So that was in the year 1971. It's a good year. And <laughs> it was a police sergeant named Thomas sergeant. Downey. 
And he described it as a large raptor type bird that was six foot tall with a 12 foot wingspan. Damn. That checks out. And he saw it near a place called Bird Hill, which is fitting AF. (laughs) 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 And then there's, of course, other reports of it, but none that I could find attributed to any solo individual. Mm hmm. Was there one? I thought I heard one about like uh oh we got podcasts down here. Sorry for any meows. Podcasts. Uh, I got some of those running around here too. <laughs> uh I thought I heard one about a Thunderbird, and maybe this was like outside of the, the triangle, but like an egg had fallen on like a car. Or- yeah, that was on that public access uh what? documentaries I saw about the Bridgewater Triangle where the lady, like the expert, said she was driving and she thought like a rock hit her car. And she went to check it out, and there was yolk all over. And she oh. found like big pieces of shell. And she didn't okay. really know what it was. And then later the next day, she was telling her mom about it. And her mom's like, You won't believe it. Me and Stacy were on the back porch, and we thought we saw a pterodactyl, but we fucking thought we didn't. We were just drinking too much or something. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, but that's amazing. Just to get, yeah, but I don't think birds are just flying and dropping their eggs. Well, I was thinking that maybe why there's so few of them because they don't know how to lay <laughs> eggs properly. Uh, <laughs> like, they, make it. they just get lucky sometimes and one lands on a soft spot. <laughs> but, well, according to uh, last week's podcast, if it's a square egg, then we know exactly what it is. It wouldn't right. be a Thunderbird. I don't remember the name of that bird. <laughs> Me neither. It was uh, uh, Puck Waka bird. The Gilly Galoo bird. Yeah, Gilly, Gilly Galoo, Galoo. Bird. Galoo bird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Square eggs so they don't roll downhill. That's right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. That makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> sure it does. Right? Sure yeah, it does. I, I don't want to know what is the hole it comes out of a square too? Then, <laughs> ooh. <laughs> Otherwise, those sharp angles. Ooh, <laughs> oof. That's one messed up cloaca. Cloaca. I thought that was a fish butthole. Birds too. Birds have cloaca yes. buttholes. Birds, birds have cloaca. Oh, because yeah, because they just they're have... mammals. Yeah, they're not mammals. <laughs> 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 that is not how science works. Uh huh. We already talked about geometry. Yeah. <laughs> and geography and geology and <laughs> all of that. Boy, we've been all over on this show today, guys. I'm trying to find so, more about the uh Oh, that's in German. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. What well, so Matt, I, I want I would like to hear about this uh insane asylum. So we were talking earlier about, um, you know, maybe it's not necessarily like a curse that creates the evil, Mm -hmm. but maybe a place where like the evil kind of starts to vortex down Mm -hmm. into a spiral. Uh, So some of the things that kind of made me go along with that was this uh, Taunton State Hospital for the Mentally Ill. We talked about uh, seeing that shadow person. Mm -hmm. Uh. Well, they say that uh, it was started as a uh, like a state lunatic asylum, which is, I mean, any time you can say the word lunatic is you got to throw that in the pod, right? Absolutely. Uh, and then it's still now open as a juvenile detention center for violent, mentally ill children. Um, delinquents. Yeah. <laughs> Dave knows a little bit about that, being a delinquent. <laughs> Uh, Me too. I just never got caught. (laughs) Right. (laughs) That's the best kind. Um, They say that uh, the staff was performing satanic rituals on the patients. Uh, There's a lot of like unexplained markings on the walls in the basement. Uh, And then one thing I found that kind of really ties it all together. And I have a a second kind of story about this. Uh, But at one point it held Jane Topin, if anybody had heard of her. Not they familiar. call her they call her uh uh the angel of death and uh she was a caregiver in nursing homes who would uh 
overdose her patients. Now it's ringing a bell. Yep. And she, uh, she killed at least 31 people, but she was convicted of killing at least 31 people. She was speculated that her numbers would be up to the hundreds. Uh, she's quoted in saying, uh, I want to have killed more people, innocent people than any other man or woman that ever lived. Um, and so when she was killing, I don't believe it was within the triangle, but just by happenstance, when she got sentenced, she got sentenced to uh, not guilty on the grounds of being insane. And then she just happened to go into the Taunton State uh, Hospital for the Mentally Ill. Kind of that vortex of her getting sucked into the triangle. Right. Uh, and it also happened to uh, Albert DeSalvo, the Boston Strangler. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he was convicted, uh, or he had confessed to strangling 11 women. Uh, he generally used their undergarments to kill them. Uh, and when he was convicted, he was sentenced to the Bridgewater state hospital for the criminally insane. So two insane asylums in the same area in a 200 square mile area. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, and he actually escaped after less than a year. Um, and then he was transferred to a different prison and stabbed by another inmate. So he kind of got it. Yeah. <laughs> but, but like I said, uh, he kind of got sucked into that vortex. That is mm-hmm. maybe the, the Bridgewater uh, correctional center. Um, the last little bit I have is uh, Massachusetts has more prisoner suicides than any other state uh, prisoners at the old colony. Uh, correctional center which is also within the bridgewater triangle i believe um are three times more likely to commit suicide than any other uh massachusetts uh correctional facility um it was originally established in or uh, the bridgewater correctional center was originally established in 1852 as a poorhouse so it had good intentions they would be where you would go if you didn't have a job and you're in the area um, and this was like a statewide, uh, a lot of small towns had them, but you couldn't go to them to get help unless you were a citizen of that city in some way. But there was a lot of immigrants and stuff, um, who didn't have a qualified place to go to get the help. So they, they created this and a couple more like it in the, in the state as like a good faith to the underprivileged, the poor, um, and stuff like that. But as uh, it started to work, um, the increasing amount of chronically ill, acutely ill, and mentally ill started kind of, you know, circling into that area. And other people were trying to get the riffraff maybe off of their streets and and to this uh, correctional center um, or this poorhouse as it would have been then. Um by the 1930s, it had become notorious for poor treatment of its patients. And by the 1960s, it was considered one of the worst, if not the worst, correctional facility in the country. So, okay, it started out as a poorhouse, but slowly turned into more of a prison type situation. Uh, so that's kind of like, you know, all, all of that maybe evil and, and maybe not evil in in the true sense, but like kind of getting sucked into one spot and then kind of getting dirtier and dirtier. Hmm. That's, that's interesting. That it, it makes you think, you know, like what is going on in this area? Well, yeah. And you were saying that there was a, a couple other triangles and I'm like trying to picture a pentagram in my head and it's got five triangles, right? It is a five pointed star, yes. Yeah, but the inside, the insides are trying, or the the corners are triangles, but the inside would be a pentagon. It's it's right? a, it, it really is just a five pointed star. So if you draw like the you know five point star, yeah. Uh, hold on, let me look. <laughs> I got it. Hold on. Oh, I can't even get to it. He's got <laughs> a lot of bobbles on there. Yeah, they're all my uh my magics and protections. So yeah, there's technically like three triangles, maybe two, three, okay. kind of with a circle around them. 
But I can see Jacob yeah. doing the Yeah, you got to do the thing. It makes sense to have five. Right. And so if there's five triangles of some sort of evil, you got the Bermuda, you got the <laughs> the one in Massachusetts, the one in the lake, and like maybe they maybe they form some. I don't know. The U.S. is fucked. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> right. And the center is the center is at Washington D.C. And this is a political podcast now. Ah. I need to move now. <laughs> <laughs> Our way ain't, ain't far enough. Pentagrams <laughs> and pentacles are not evil. <clears throat> Benjamin, oh, you're oops. evil. <laughs> and you're saying that. I am not evil. <laughs> you just so, haven't caught yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, taking it back. I'm a little mean sometimes, but I'm not evil. I save so, kittens and shit. Did you see some of the other reasons why people went to the hospital there? No. Were they? Um, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and Tourette's, mm. and women who experience anxiety and panic attacks and postpartum depression. All those like disease, all those things that back in the day they would have been like, ah, oh, the devil's in them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, broad's crazy. Throw her in the nut house. <laughs> their science <laughs> to cure patients. It, it says it included mostly pseudosciences like uh, phrenology which measured a person's skull dead or alive to find patterns that the mentally ill shared Jeez. solitary confinement, electroshock and lobotomies were commonplace in this hospital. Oof, sounds good like old a good fashioned time. lobotomy. That'll <laughs> cure, <laughs> cure most of it. <laughs> if it doesn't cure it, it won't matter because you can't do yeah, anything anyway. You, you at least won't be complaining about it. <laughs> you might be thinking about doing evil stuff, but you can't move. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. All I'm right, still well, reading. Keep, uh, he's still reading. <laughs> it says a uh, notorious satanic cult in the area operated underneath the hospital dark rituals and even human sacrifices and today there are still strange and unexplained markings on the wall of the basement and while the hospital was still open staff would attempt to go downstairs into the basement area only to be stopped by a force once their foot reached the bottom step damn mm. another commonly reported happening are ghastly embodied disembodied screams that echo the hospital grounds blood curdling horrifying screams they are cries for help and sobbings are also heard when moving about the hospital these hauntings have even seeped into the surrounding woods the entire campus is deemed haunted uh, it is even referred to as america's most haunted asylum and that the devil checks himself in there <laughs> when he needs a break right yeah he needs a break gotta <laughs> relax for a minute i'm pretty sure every haunted asylum is america's most haunted asylum <laughs> and like right. waverly and the traverse city state hospital oh, traverse city definitely they're they're all america's most haunted it's like every haunted hotel is america's most haunted hotel too yeah i guess it's a good I'll way to get people in there I was amazed to see how much like satanic stuff was going on there. That was just outrageous, isn't it? Yeah, because it seemed like in the woods, like they were just stumbling across like satanic dens and like bunkers. Mm -hmm. And they were always finding like mutilated animals. And I guess like in 1999, there were like 12 calves that were mutilated there. Mm -hmm. But they were saying they were, they like took all their blood. But they were like mutilated in a way that they're like, this has to be like some kind of weird cult. Mm -hmm. But in that documentary, they talked to that cop and it seemed like for the 20 years he was on the force, he was always up there like finding a body or finding dead animals. Or, mm -hmm. um, and near that area is when uh, Carl Drew and Robin Murray Murphy, uh, they allegedly like killed three prostitutes and someone said it was like i think robin sold out carl and said it was like he was killing him to offer him to satan mm -hmm. and that people because he was like a pimp and like his prostitutes said that they did some like satanic rituals with them or like were forced to and um 
that being big in the news in 1970s actually kind of like sparked off like the satanic panic of the time mm-hmm. when all those like uh made for tv movies started coming out about like uh people in black robes stealing your kids to take them out into the woods mm-hmm. yeah and uh but then i guess today uh some of the witnesses from that trial are like backpedaling and saying that they were kind of coerced into saying that um kind of like the west memphis three kind of situation where the cops were like oh there's dead prostitutes we don't really care about them then the news finds out and it becomes a big stink so then they have to be like oh we got to find someone who killed these people and this guy's a satanist or this guy's a weirdo so Mm -hmm. he probably did it yeah there was that that was the weren't they the ones that told him about the cabin um can't remember who that was yeah or someone just i know someone stumbled upon the den but yeah the bunker the bunker yeah but maybe they did tell him about that cabin with all that upside down crosses and pentagrams Mm -hmm. and baby dolls stapled to trees yeah all that weird stuff yeah which like again it's kind of a twofold thing when you look at like satanic ritual stuff because on the one hand you have actual satanists who do rituals that i'm not familiar with and then you have teenagers like those ones that stole old girl's head yeah that are just kind of like playing at it and get themselves wrapped up into some real dumb ideas right well and i i had heard that uh they have like you have your satanists who like there's a church for and stuff mm-hmm. like that. But then uh, I had also heard people talking about devil worshipers, mm-hmm. which is maybe just like a more uh, sloppy version that they're, they're just all about the, like trying to get the devil to be summoned, like some sort of monster to do either their bidding or the devil's bidding or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's, it's like a, a less of a religion and more of a, something done in maybe an anger more so well you have like the church of satan is like one entity and they don't believe really in anything right. yeah it's more they, like a agnostic type thing it, it, they believe simply in this is the life you have live the life you have have fun with it don't hurt nobody that's like their whole mm-hmm. thing wrapped up in one and then you have like the more I guess Anton LaVey, Alistair Crowley, like dark we, magic ritual guys, like, and they do all the drinking out of skulls and animal sacrifice. Right. Stuff. Trying to get more power or riches yeah. or whatever you're trying to do with your sacrifices and your right. rituals. And it sounds like those were the guys that were hanging out in Freetown Forest. <laughs> yeah. Doing creepy shit. But at the same time, being a delinquent myself i could see stacking rocks in like a pentagram just so some hiker would walk by and it freak and out. freak out yeah i mean that's yeah. that that happens too you know you have kids that do that or carve you know the upside down crosses and stuff just to get a reaction yeah, yeah just to freak people out you know right so that's a thing too now but when you push it to animal sacrifice yeah that's a little much that's yeah. not kids just dicking around anymore that's you know, unstable. it's a little something different. Yeah, right. yeah, that's unstable. They were been to Northern Michigan before then. <laughs> when they're stealing heads, you know, that's normal teenage yeah, stuff I in know. Northern Michigan. You, you, <laughs> yeah, you guys get weird up there. I know what <laughs> everyone else is weird. <laughs> Getting all that Canadian runoff. <laughs> that's what it is. <laughs> Maple syrup sugar high up there. I don't know what you guys are doing. Chopping beavers' heads off with ice skates. That's what we do. (laughs) That was all I had. uh, If you guys had any more. About maple syrup? (laughs) Just pass that right through the screen. (laughs) No, other than like, I don't know. There's just so much that goes on there. But right. at the same time, so few, like, Consistent. most of the time when I look into this stuff or, you know, I'm sure you guys have the same thing. You can find, like, eyewitness accounts say this and eyewitness accounts say that. And this guy says this happened to him. And this guy says that. there's very little of that that actually goes on in the Bridgewater Triangle. At least yeah. tangible. 
you know, it's just more like everybody says this happened and everybody says that happened. You know, it's it's just yeah, they have stories that they just yeah. kind of pass around. I guess the only firsthand account I heard was that uh, Bill Russo, mm-hmm. yep. where he was out walking his dog. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. And um, I guess the way he explains it, it was like a, like how they cut through a forest to put up power lines. He was kind of like walking his dog through that. And there was a spot that had a, a street light. And as he came walking up to it, he heard like a, like a high pitched voice um, saying, he watch you, he watch you. And like this little chipmunk pot bellied <laughs> pygmy comes like walking into the street light and just like puts its hand out. And it's like, he watch you. And the guy was like, uh, he's like, it was trying to, it didn't like get, closer to him but it was trying to like beckon him to like come towards him and bill was like uh nope and he just turned around and walked <laughs> home. Yep. he nope the hell out of there with his little dog yeah which that fits way more into puck wudgy lore than the lady that gets possessed yeah in anything i've ever heard about puck wudgies i, I haven't heard before that they possess people and I could be wrong about that. It's not like I'm a puck wudgie expert. <laughs> but the description of this little guy being like three, four feet tall, covered in hair, you know, whatever. That's more along a puck wudgie line. Yeah. And they're said to beckon people into the forest and try to, like, lead them off cliffs and shit. So that kind of fits that fairly. Yeah, that's well. kind of what I thought, too. And are, are puck wudgies one of those things that, like, are kind of... Uh, in other cultures as well. Maybe they don't call them puck wedgies. Ewoks? <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of people do kind of like lump puck wedgies in with some of your uh, we folk folklore from like Ireland mm. and whatever, you know, okay. in the fey categories. Yeah. Okay. They do, they do have some similarities in that way. Are they, are they across the u.s at all uh with other uh experiences with them now again i'm gonna say you know not, caveat not this by a, saying not i am not an expert <laughs> not an expert and especially when it comes to native american lore mm-hmm. i do know quite a bit of it just in general it's so varied from one tribe to the next mm-hmm. to the next there's very very little crossover you know yeah. when you look at like skinwalkers that's not a fully Native American. Not every Native American tribe has those, believes in them, talks about them, knows about them. You know, it's all like Southwestern tribe stuff. Yeah. Puckwudgies, from my memory and from what I can, like, you know, kind of put together for myself, it's kind of like a Ohio River Valley East thing. Mm, okay. You know, Northeast, kind of into the Ohio River Valley, maybe a little into the Great Lakes region area. I don't remember having heard of any tribes like that talk about them outside of that, you know? Okay. So, yeah, yeah. but it's very much this area. This you know? Bridgewater area. Yeah. That's the only place that I've heard of them. And they're more like, like you said, the Fay or like a will of the wisp, will of the wisp. Cause they can also turn into lights, I guess. Yeah. That's part of, like, of the lore. Yep. Yeah. That spook fire or whatever it's mm-hmm. called. That could also be like attributed to them. Mm -hmm. but i guess the forestry service in october they have a puck wudgie crossing sign that they like stick in the forest (laughs) (laughs) i want to go get a picture of that yeah but yeah bill russo's sighting is is and if you watch it on the documentary the guy seems pretty damn genuine about it yeah you know, he was saying like it was 20 years ago and he didn't bring it up until he like made a little blog post or something. About right. It. He's like, OK, I'm getting old now. People need to know about this thing. Yeah. Well, and you, and you know what? I did actually hear. I think uh, I heard like two of Barnum and Bailey's circus acts came from this area. And one of them was Tom Thumb. So he would have been just a couple of feet tall. <laughs> uh and I didn't look into it. This is just coming from my memory, but but uh and then also the skeleton man who was, I mean, arguably just a really skinny dude. 
Yeah. But uh, with with Tom Thumb, I mean, that that's kind of an interesting tie in. Are you saying that Tom Thumb is a puck wudgie? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Shave him down, put a little hat on him. He's a puck wudgie hybrid. (laughs) Half man, half puck wudgie. There you go. You should be so lucky. (laughs) (laughs) At least you get magic powers. Yeah. This is a really good time, guys. Yeah, absolutely. I really appreciated you guys doing this. Really glad you guys uh, joined us here. This has been a blast. Yeah. We'll We'll have to do it again. We've got a couple more triangles to cover, right? We'll call it the the, uh, Blue Ribbon Paranatural Podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Sounds like we won an award that way. (laughs) (laughs) Award winning. (laughs) All right, guys. uh, You want to tell everybody about your show, where to find you guys? Uh, Yeah, we're the Blue Ribbon Launch Podcast. uh, And you can find us most places i suggest spotify youtube uh or you can hit our website what's that website dave uh blue ribbon lounge dot com nope. <laughs> yeah just dot com <laughs> yeah uh and we got all our stuff on there and you can find contact us uh and we got merch shop com. you should check that out ben yeah i think you'd like that place sure uh, right. shop com. uh but that's pretty much it yeah you just look us up on facebook Facebook got, groups and pages yeah. and everything else. Yeah. How about you guys? You you tell us stuff now. So we are the Paranatural Podcast. Uh, we are available wherever you get your podcasts or at our website, paranaturalpodcast.com, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, we're on Twitter, but I don't know how to twit. So <laughs> don't bother looking for us there. Um, yeah, there you go. Cool, man. Well, we're going to have to do this again. All Thanks right, gentlemen. It has been a great time. Yeah. It's been A pleasure. (laughs) Have a good one, guys. See you later. Be good to yourselves. Are you just about to quote Bill and Ted? (laughs) Be excellent (laughs) to each other. And party on. All right, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that as much as we did. And if you did, head on over to the Blue Ribbon Lounge podcast and show our friends Matt and Dave some love. There is a link to their website in the show notes. So head on over there. Give them a little love for us. And if you enjoy this show and you want to help us grow, there are a few ways to do that. You can leave us a five-star rating and review on your podcast player of choice, or you can just share the show with a friend. Either way, really helps us, and we really appreciate it. That's all I've got for now. As always, thank you for listening, and good night.